Okay. So I think we're going to start. Uh, we're um, still working on our live stream, but we will post it uh, to our um, uh, website, itif.org, later, and uh, all the uh, presentations uh, as well as the um, discussion will be there. Um, and we hope to... Uh, uh, um, get the live feed going as soon as possible. So I want to thank you all for coming uh, on this cold and rainy day. Uh, my name is Joe Kennedy. I'm a senior fellow here at ITIF, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And I, I uh, think we're going to have a good discussion here about the possibilities of automation in the freight uh, transportation sector and the correct regulatory approach uh, to that possibility. Um, I'm going to start with a brief presentation about uh, discussing a paper I wrote for ITIF. Uh, we'll then have uh, three panelists um, who I'll introduce later. Each will talk for about 10 minutes about the uh, possibilities of in innovation and automation in their sectors and industries and, and the regulatory hurdles or, or uh, help that they're receiving. Um, the uh, if I encourage you to participate uh, in the discussion, uh, those of you who are here and eventually those uh, hopefully remotely, by going to our hashtag ITIF Transport. That's ITIF Transport. Um, so after our present, after the members uh, of the panel have each spoken for about 10 minutes, so we have a short uh, uh, discussion uh, in which I give the panelists the opportunity to, to respond to each other, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, and we'll end at 11.30. Uh, so now I'll introduce the three panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, Thomas Je uh, Jensen is um, Senior Vice President for Transportation Policy at UPS. In this capacity, he leads UPS's federal authority and is chief uh, advocate on all modes of surface transportation, legislative, and regulatory issues. Uh, these include commercial vehicle fleet matters, highway and infrastructure policy, uh, ocean freight trans uh, shipping, and railroad and intermodal transportation concerns. Tom began his career at UPS uh, in the Public Affairs Department in 1990 and has since held a variety of assignments including in operations, business development, human resources, and in-house legal counsel. He joined the Washington, D.C. Public Affairs Office in January 2001. Prior to joining UPS, Mr. Jensen served as a campaign aide to former Congressman Stuart B. McKinney, uh, managed a congressional campaign, and worked for both a political fundraising firm and later a grassroots lobbying firm. He earned his undergraduate degree in government from the College of William and Mary, a master's degree in public administration from the American University, and a law degree from the University of Bridgeport. He is admitted to the bar in Connecticut and Pennsylvania and currently serves on several industry boards relating to transportation. Adrian Arna Arnakis uh, is uh, currently Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the uh, Association of American Railroads. Uh, prior to joining AAR in November 2018, she served as the Deputy Staff Director for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation under Chairman John Thune. She oversaw the operation of one of the Senate's most productive bipartisan committees, which during her tenure secured the enactment of more than 50 laws, most recently the five-year reauthorization of FAA. She also served as the committee's counsel and policy director of surface transportation and oceans from 2013 to 2015, where she led the team that wrote negotiated and secured enactment of the bipartisan Fixing America's Surface Transportation or FAST Act. Adrian earned her BA in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her JD from the University of Miami School of Law. 
Greg Rogers is the Director of Government Affairs and Mobility Informa Innovation at Securing America's Future Energy, or SAFE. In this role, Greg advocates for federal and state policies that will enable the safe and expeditious adoption of autonomous vehicles and other emerging technologies. Prior to joining SAFE, he was the assistant editor of EO Transportation, Eno Transportation Weekly and a senior policy analyst at the Eno Center for Transportation, where he reported on transportation policy developments in Congress, the administration, and state governments. During his time Eno, at Eno, Greg also authored two reports that have assisted numerous federal, state, and local policymakers in establishing sound policies to prepare for the advent of autonomous vehicles. Greg is a co-host and co-founder of the Mil Mobility Podcast and a co-founder of Connected Car Talk DC, a rapidly expanding network comprised of hundreds of professionals working at the intersection of transportation technology and policy. He received his BA in political economy from the University of California at Berkeley and has studied political science at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. So now I'll uh, briefly describe uh, some of the main points in a uh, report I authored for ITIF. Uh, the report was called Moving America, How Policymakers Can Accelerate Automation in Freight, Freight Transportation. We have copies at the door and you can also download it off of our website. Uh, this report gives an overview of current developments in the freight transportation sector. It describes some of the opportunities for automation in the different freight industries, including trucking, trains, and drones. Uh, it also talks about the regulatory challenges that different industries are facing and suggests principles that both the regulators and industry ought to follow as they oversee the implementation of new technology. So first, a few basic facts about automation. First, automation does not reduce the number of jobs in the medium or long term. It does not reduce the number of jobs in the medium and long term or, or long term. Uh, the number of jobs over the medium term is determined largely by the population and by the wealth of the population. Uh, automation can reduce jobs in the short term or not, uh, depending upon how easily it's integrated into existing systems. Automation does boost productivity <coughs> which is necessary for the rise in li living standards and it allows workers to drop some of the most tedious parts of their current jobs. In many cases automation produces better safety and performance than humans are capable of. Finally, automation is a process not an end result. It takes time to perfect and it takes time to integrate into uh, the existing uh, business uh, practices. Therefore, society and regulators need patience as the technology becomes better. They also need to uh, ensure that there are continuous incentives to invest in new technology. And I should add that uh, we also, um, in, especially in the tra transportation sector, uh, it makes a difference whether the main regulator is at the federal level or the state level. What we don't want is for a bunch of uh, different and often conflicting state regulations. It's it's much easier if this is uh, if de decisions are made at the federal level. Uh, as far as freight transportation specifically, it should be noted that freight industries are experiencing a shortage of qualified workers, and that's expected to get worse over time. According to a Boeing report, 42% of pilots will reach mandatory retirement age in the next 10 years. Uh, Union Pacific is currently offering bonuses of twenty to $100,000 for workers to sign up. And a recent uh, ATA, uh, 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 American Transportation Association's report, uh, estimated that there would be 175,000 
uh, jobs unfilled for truckers by 2024. Uh, Indus second, industries in this sector both compete and cooperate with each other to deliver millions of packages across the country. Uh, in, for, many, um, for, 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 for many jobs, the industries compete. Uh, you can go from mode to mode. But in the end, they all have to cooperate and make it possible to ship, to transfer packages from one industry to another seamlessly. Um, interestingly, each industry has its own regulator. The Federal Railroad Administration regulates railroads. Uh, trucking is regulated by a combination of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And then the Federal Aviation Administration regulates drones in airlines. Uh, and then as a final point, if the U.S. does not lead in these technologies, others will. Assuming that the technology is economically competitive, it's going to go forward. And the main question is, will the U.S. be at the forefront or will it be a laggard in developing the technology and implementing it? One could argue that in Europe, the commercial train sector is ahead of us in automation. Uh, China has just made a huge bet on artificial intelligence, which is a key component of any automotive uh, technology. So what are the principles that regulators should follow? The first is overall to welcome technology. Realizing that technological advance is going to continue, even if the technology is not ready now, it probably will be eventually. Automation promises several benefits, including lower costs, better safety, less pollution, and faster delivery times. Regulators ought, ought to welcome these possibilities and push for their development. Uh, they should help the industry get the technology from where it is to where it needs to be, while at the same time protecting public safety and confidence. Second principle is to acknowledge that other forces encourage companies to act responsibly. The, these include the high cost of capital sunk into each rail car, truck, or plane. Uh, they also include uh, and I should ma mention that the, the, any disruption in service is also uh, extremely co costly. Uh, they also include tort laws that are designed to protect victims of an accident. Uh, there's also the need to maintain not just sa public safety, but the public reputation for safety. And that can be very important. We all know that Lots of accidents occur uh, on the streets of any major city every day, but we don't really think about it. But if there's one accident involving an autonomous vehicle anywhere in the country, it becomes national news. And so it, it, the public is not going to accept automation if it doesn't believe that it's safe. Um, and then finally, every company these days needs to worry about brand value, its relationship with consumers, and the loyalty of its workers. And we've all seen that all of these can react quickly to impose a penalty on a company that is f f in the process is far faster and incur can inc uh, cause a much greater economic penalty than anything that the regulator can impose. Third is regulators need to allow for different technology futures. Accept that change, including technology, is constant. Therefore, regulators need to avoid a bias for the status quo or for any particular technology and to welcome the opportunity for better performance and price. Regulators need to write rules that avoid favoring particular technologies or business models. Fourth, regulators also need to distinguish between substantially different technologies. They need to tailor regulation to specific technologies rather than treating all technologies the same. They also need to allow for write rules that allow for technology to be introduced gradually as it's proven out and to, become, and to be agnostic about which particular technology is chosen. 
The fifth principle is that regulators need to prioritize regulation according to safety and innovation potential. They ought to concentrate on those issues that have a high effect on safety and also show significant potential for rapid innovation. If they get regulation, if regulation is too lenient, safety concerns can become, uh, become serious. On the other hand, if it's too strict, they lose the vast potential of faster, reg uh, faster innovation. Uh, on the other hand, where, uh, there, where uh, particular technologies involve few concerns regarding public safety and also show the potential for rapid innovation, regulators can, uh, can improve the process by withdrawing uh, some of their regulations. Uh, the downside of under-regulating is reduced by the fact that public safety concerns really aren't uh, involved, and yet once again, overregulation can inhibit the gains or prevent the gains of what otherwise would be rapid technological advancement. The sixth principle requires an improvement in the design, the decision process. Rule making currently can take two years or more, not including court challenges. Regulators therefore need to write rules with broad safety and other standards that can adapt as, as technology and other factors change. Uh, it, regulators also need to maintain a constant dialogue with the industry to form a common understanding of what technologies are coming uh, c coming in the future, what the regulator might or is likely to expect uh, from the industry, and what sa how to balance safety concerns. Uh, forming a sort of common expectation about w how the regulator s for sees um, uh, automation and other technology can help um, in, in attracting capital into an industry and in, 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 in maintain incentives to con continually innovate. Uh, and then finally, uh, regulators uh, need the re necessary resources. Uh, unfortunately, discretionary non-defense funds have been squeezed for a long time and the problem is likely to get worse before it gets better. But regulators must have the resources to understand the latest technologies, make timely decisions, and to do adequate enforcement. A big part of this is that they need to be able to adequately compensate, train, motivate, and retain some of the best experts in the industry. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll now turn it over to Tom, who will present his slides. More automation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it very much for you and ITF for having us this forum this morning and appreciate everybody coming out on a lousy day. So thanks for being here. Uh, it's interesting. A lot of things are interesting, but this is particularly interesting, I thought. Uh, Joe and I chatted a while back about this information, the research they did on this paper that you have in the back of the room we just covered, and, and I think they may have pitched UPS on it, frankly, but uh, full disclosure, we had nothing to do with that paper. Nothing. Yet, all the things Joe mentions, I think, uh, for large measure, are right on the money. And I would suggest that Adrian and Greg may say the same thing. We have some differences and different modes and ideas and whatnot, but uh, the outline that he just reviewed, I think, is, is again, where we need to be um, as a broadly defined transportation industry as we consider automation. Just how do I advance this, by the way, Joe? That might be helpful. Uh, just think about. Uh, just cue that up. Just, just UPS's business. Uh, we've been in business since 1907, and our business has changed dramatically, dramatically. And today, it's changing even more. And one of the reasons it's changing is because of the change in consumer behavior. Uh, for, for years and years, we got really good at taking packages from a business to a business. But in the last 15 years, that's been packages from a business to a consumer.
right? And it's into a residence. And that has changed everything in our organization. Uh, the, the way we market, the way we offer services, the way we price our services, and so on and so forth. That's in our core businesses. Little brown trucks delivering a package to your home. But furthermore, we, we have a huge uh, challenge moving forward as it relates to freight. And I'd suggest that uh, the Congress and the regulatory agencies to date have really looked at mobility. They've looked at how people are going to get around in the future. But we need to think and focus on freight for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, uh, if, if the freight forecasts are half correct, if they're half correct, we're getting a lot more trucks out there. We're getting more congestion on the freight rail network. We're getting more congestion in the aviation network. And it's just going to happen. Uh, you know, 25% increase in freight movements, to broadly defined freight by 2040, 25%. That's called economic progress. So people up here on the hill can complain all they want about you want this, you want that. But they all, every single one of them, all 535, wants economic growth and economic progress. And we tell them this all the time. Yet at times they hamstring what we need to do to move the bundles, as we call it. And if we're moving a the tractor trailer load of packages or heavy freight or things of that nature from UPS, uh, there, there's a shipper on one end and a consignee on the other. It's not a UPS owned movement per se, but there's a shipper on one end and a bunch of different recipients on the other. So we're trying to move this economy forward and at times it becomes difficult. I'll show you some pictures because they're kind of interesting, kind of cool. They take up some time and then we'll talk about some important stuff and then we'll kick it around with Adrian and, and Greg. So from a UPS perspective, one thing we need to do in the future, and we have a huge optics problem here, a huge optic problem is it relates to vehicle platooning and technology and the way we move trucks. I mean, people don't like trucks as it is. They think they're going to like them anymore when they've got no one driving them or less, you know, a, more, a lot more technology. Of course not. But this is a continuum. Joe said it earlier, right? It's an evolution, not a revolution. We're talking about platooning, for example. Assisted or linked cruise control. That's what it is. It's linked cruise control between two commercial vehicles. And the idea would be in the future that we move freight movements on highways, maybe from, uh, you know, destined, you know, big freight facilities, if you will, uh, big big hub type facilities, highway movements only in vehicles that are, that are linked together uh, through connected cruise control uh, for fuel economy benefits. That's what it is. And you get 12% fuel economy benefits from the guy in the front, uh, guy in the back, excuse me, and you get 3% uh, fuel economies from the other tractor. So that's the kind of thing that moving forward, we need a framework, a federal framework that allows the states to continue to innovate, right, uh, but doesn't set up a whole patchwork across the country. We don't like the patchwork. It doesn't matter what the context is. We need a network, not a patchwork. Because freight movements, freight moves like water, right? Path of least resistance. And it doesn't stop at state borders. So we need a, a network, not a patchwork. And from a regulatory perspective, federally and state, that's an ongoing theme of a company like UPS. I can't speak for our competitors, but they have the same problems. And the industry has the same problems. And again, we're a multimodal integrated service provider, not just a trucking company. Uh, we've put 3,000 trainers, uh, trailers and containers a day on the railroads. Adrian knows this well. 3,000 trailers and containers a day on the railroads. We move 600,000 TEUs annually on the ocean. And we have f almost 600 aircraft, integrated intermodal, intermodal transportation service provider. And the customer really doesn't care what mode the package goes on, or the freight goes on, or the oversized good, or the hazardous material. All they care is that it got there, number one, on uh, the time that we promised them, it got there, number two, in good shape, right? And increasingly, did we do use a sustainable route these days, which is a great thing to hear, right? And that's it. So in any event, we, we need platooning is just an example of the things that we need to move forward, because ultimately it's going to kind of look like this, which is kind of, it was just really cool when you think about it. All these guys in the lower left are smart. They're smarter than they were, right? They've got all these geofenced or LIDAR or whatever it is, the technology, I, we don't care about that. But they're communicating with each other, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian. Remember, we have a huge optic problem. We, again, broadly defined transportation industry because, you know, 37,000 people lost their lives on American highways last year. 37,000 people. That's unacceptable by any definition. Government, regulator, private citizen, corporation. That's a bad, I mean, it's a horrible deal. Horrific. So how are we going to work and solve, on, uh, solve that and mitigate those, the, the risks on the highways? Well, technology is part of the answer. But the optics are difficult, again. You, you know, and, and the government to date has looked at individuals and mobility first, freight second. And we think we should be looking at freight for the economic reasons and, the, and, and for the safety applications as well. So that's kind of the future, what we think is kind of neat. It's very different than today, frankly. Uh, the automation, we won't go through this because you've seen it before and you know what it means, but the whole point is this is a continuum. 
from no automation to fully automation. And connected cruise control and driver assist technologies are level one, level two. Driver assist technologies. That's all. That's only where we are today. And there are those who think that that is not progress. It is progress for a variety of reasons. Uh, further, you know, we've got the, the neatest and coolest technology on commercial vehicles these days, and I know the railroads are the same way, and the aircraft, particularly the same way today, much better than it was in the past. Uh, just for on the on the trucking side, for example, collision mitigation systems, you know, uh, uh, electronic braking systems, uh, speed limiters. Uh, you know, anti-rollover technology, and there's series. There's a series of different platforms, so they don't have the same names, different commercial names, because different commercial vendors uh, build these technologies and, and, and big, sell them to big fleet operators. But it's such a different tractor that is for the tractor trailer. It's such a different unit than it was 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and it's so much more incredibly safe today. And that's a story that we got to keep telling to regulators and legislators as we move forward. We talked about some of this stuff. I just turned this off, Joe. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, I know Greg will, about where we are with electrification and what the future is. It's great for fossil fuels and for emissions and sustainability purposes, but you know we're all in on that, and that's where the industry ultimately is moving. UPS has ordered 125 of the Tesla tractors. They don't even make them yet. We ordered 125 of them, and they're not cheap, right? But the idea is we've got to work on the new technologies, work on the range of these vehicles, how they perform in different climates, different geographies, uh, so we can utilize electricity and uh, you know, get away from fossil fuels. Uh, that's, uh, we are getting asked more and more in the past about sustainability of the fleet, uh, where we are from a green, kind of a green factor, and that, that's an important issue. And we need to work with regulators and legislators as we develop technologies that will allow us to get there. Um, all this said, uh, the pictures are over. Think about this. Uh, we, we, we need, from a perspective, of uh, uh, a strong federal framework uh, so we can integrate these technologies into our systems because, once again, we need the network, not a patchwork. Autonomous vehicles is a great example. Uh, the, the states are doing great things as it relates to AVs, and, but the states are doing it all a little bit different. And the federal government to date has kind of punted on the issue. We're hoping in the 116th Congress that we can move forward with a, a framework that helps uh, innovators, helps uh, manufacturers, helps large fleet operators uh, to, to embrace these technologies and integrate these technologies. There's no guarantee that's going to happen, but that's our ask you know, a couple miles away from here. Uh, it's the same thing as it relates to uh, unmanned aviation systems or drones. Right now, uh, there's this cumbersome process, which is really no process, on how we integrate drones for commercial activities. Uh, freight railroads use drones. They use drones to inspect track, which is a good thing. They can for compromises in track and for safety purposes. UPS would like to use drones at a couple capacities. Number one, we can inspect our buildings. Uh, we've got 1,500 buildings around the country, and we've got all kinds of issues and occasionally where we're using other uh, more cumbersome methods to inspect the building, uh, but that would be one application. Another application might be down the road, might be uh, one of our competitors likes to talk about unmanned freight flights, just big package freighters that are unmanned. You know, maybe that's pie in the sky stuff, but sooner or later, we're, we're probably going to get there. And we have a really neat application I'll show you in a minute. It relates to little brown trucks and maybe delivering packages in, in rural and super rural areas. Uh, but we need to figure that out from the FAA and the federal and DOT side on what we're doing with unmanned aviation systems. I think it's fair to say DOT wants to figure it out. It's cumbersome. There's a lot of issues, a lot of concerns. There's privacy concerns and safety concerns, and you've got idiots flying drones real close to airports right now, things of that nature, and, and that's a problem. Uh, but there, is a, there are legitimate commercial applications that we think are, uh, make sense that can uh, inc increase economic output, uh, that can help safety, and, and that can uh, you know, provide kind of new jobs, by the way, new jobs. Because as Joe indicated earlier, uh, there's problems with truck driver shortage, there's problems with pilot shortage. That's legitimate. And we've got young folks and greater diversity coming into our industry, and, and, they, and those folks are interested in technology-type jobs, and that's where the kind of the puck is going as it relates to the jobs we have. Uh, thirdly, I'd suggest that w tech, uh, regulators and legislators need to be careful, and, and we need to be careful on the kind of the modal warfare deal. I mean, trucks and trains have fought historically on some issues, freight issues over the years, but uh, there's enough freight to go around. There certainly is. Uh, you know, as, again, we're involved in, in all modes, air, ocean, ground, intermodal rail, and, and uh, we think that we do better, we being a, a broadly defined transportation industry, if we work together on these issues to the extent we can before and, and present a, re a, a uniform front to regulators and legislators. I think that makes sense. I think we need to remind ourselves that sometimes. Uh, fourth point, UPS believes, and I know a lot of other members in the trucking community believe that we need to protect the 
radio frequencies that the government set aside years ago for vehicle communications. So this 5.9 giga, gigahertz spectrum deal, you know, that we protect that for uh, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to, to infrastructure and vehicle to pedestrian kind of platforms that we'll need. Uh, I think it's been well covered. We want to innovate and collaborate and I think that will happen as we move forward. And, and lastly, uh, the jobs issue, which, which Joe brought up. Uh, these are change jobs, different jobs. Uh, we think ultimately that we're going to be fine as it relates to, to, to jobs. The jobs may look a little different, but there will be a role for young folks and for, for old folks who've worked in the transportation industry for many, many years. Uh, but that shouldn't be a reason to uh, stop us and block us and provide an impediment to technology and advancement. And we'll ha we can uh, wrap this up with some questions here after uh, the, the remaining panelists speak. Joe? question is, are the regulators and the policy makers ready? And that is one that I think we are hopeful for, but, you know, we're still going to have to wait and see a little bit more. But before I get into that, I wanted to just give you a quick rundown of who we are and uh, I think a lot of folks, you know, see railroad, think they know what we are, but I found a lot of surprising sort of stories that, about us. Uh, we are a privately owned 140,000 mile network. We support about 200 and $20 billion in economic output per year, which translates into about 1.1 million jobs. And we move everything. We move you know, things that you think about like grain and coal and energy projects. Uh, but you know, over Super Bowl, we were promoting on our social media that we were moving a lot of beer, getting ready for Super Bowl. But uh, you know, we also move intermodal freight. In fact, our biggest customer over all our uh, uh, seven class one railroads is UPS. Uh, it's a growing part of our business, it's a part of business we're very supportive of and that we're investing a lot of time and money on. Um, but, it, you know, again, we are competitors, but we're also, uh, you know, allies and together w it's how we really make the freight network work. Uh, how are we able to do all this, move all these goods? And the answer is uh, two part. One is <coughs> we invest incredibly every, every year. We spend about $25 billion annually in our network. Uh, Improving tracks, investing in technology, expansion, all, all across the gamut. Other thing is, we, you know, just like our, our friends, we, pro we promote safety. And we are, you know, some of the safest we've ever been. Since just 2000, our train accident rate has uh, decreased by 40%, and our employee injury rate is down 43%. And part of the reason we're able to do this is because we've made a big commitment to it. And the other part of the reason is we're really embracing technology. So sort of what, what are some of these t technologies? Uh, when we were driving, when I was driving here today this morning, I drive from Virginia over Potomac River, and I saw the CSX train pulling out. I don't know if any of you see it, have that same commute. You know, it has the Tropicana trains. Or, so you look at that and you're like, is this, what kind of train is this? This is the train that I saw when I was a kid, and my parents saw, my grandparents saw. The reality is it's completely different. It's a 200-ton supercomputer rolling down the tracks. It, uh, that we have technology that addresses efficiency, we have trust, uh, sustainability, uh, safety, sort of all across the board. So for example, uh, on, the safe, on the efficiency side of things, we really, you know, when you think of big data, you probably think of Facebook or Google or one of those other companies, but railroads are, are actually huge collectors of data and we use that data and analyze it to, to make our network better. So we collect what's in our train, where it, where it starts, where it goes, what time of year it goes, where are their bottlenecks, are there bottlenecks at a certain time of year, is it because of certain weather, is it, you know, all of the different facts and all the different possibilities we consider, we analyze, and then we improve our network in those ways. From the sustainability side, all of our locomotives have fuel, fuel management systems in them, and that has led us to be incredibly efficient. So for uh, one ton of freight, we can move 480 miles almost on uh, one gallon of diesel. And that, you know, my car can't even go 
a week on one tank of gas going 480 miles. So to think about sort of moving the amount of freight we're able to do with uh, just that little bit of fuel, I think is really impressive. And that's because of our technology and our fuel man management. On the safety side, Tom mentioned the drones that we're using. We also are using some really neat uh, inspection technology that we actually put right on our locomotives and our rail cars that looks at the track as we move forward and finds any defects. The uh, data is showing that that's 50% more effective than our current model, which is just a guy walking the tracks, looking down and seeing what he can find. So we really are uh, sort of experiencing a, a sort of revolution. But it's not just going to be what we can put on the trains or on the tracks. It's going to also be sort of how we can work together. Uh, while we are really safe, one of the hardest safety hurdles we have is um, trespass and grade crossings. It's actually the vast majority, like 90% of all our accidents involve trespass and grade crossings. Uh, but something like autonomous vehicles, trucks, cars really we think have the potential to revolutionize that problem. Um, you know, they're being designed so that they can see what's coming in ahead of them, what's coming to the left, what's coming to the right. So when they come on the grade to a grade crossing, they will stop or they will determine it's safe enough to cross as opposed to humans who sometimes misjudge and end up getting st stuck on the traps because of congestion and unfortunately trains do not stop very quick and usually, you know, they can't stop fast enough. So being able to eliminate that grade crossing problem just through the technology that's going to be in cars and tr uh, trucks is, I think, going to be a big jump forward. So we have all this technology. What do we sort of need to maximize it and utilize it? And that's when we turn to the policy makers and the regulators. I think sort of our position, you know, we have a vast array of things and I think they're very similar to a lot of the stuff that Tom has covered and I'm assuming Greg's going to cover. but. Uh, I think we have a set of regulators that are interested. A good quote that I always like to read is from the uh, current FRA administrator, Ron Batori. He says, technology will move faster than the ink can be applied or dried on regulations. And if we don't use technology, it will pass it up. And that's the mentality we need from our regulators and, that's, and our policymakers. And that's sort of what we're asking. So specifically, things like risk. When you have a new, Id new idea, new technology, you can't guarantee that there's going to be zero risk. You just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, that's the sort of beauty and the scary thing about something new. So we should be, and we do have a sense of risk management, and we should be required to do that, but we shouldn't be required to have zero risk if we're going to try something new. Also, you know, mention mode neutral. Not only, you know, between you know, trucks and trains and drones and planes, but also between which technology you pick and which company. You know, we're talking about it, how it being, you know, different manufacturers call it different things. We don't need regulations and laws that are written to only favor one over the other. Each individual should be able to choose what works best for them. A great example of this, for instance, is our locomotives. So, you know, I mentioned how fuel efficient we are. What we've found, though, is the type of locomotive that is the most fuel efficient to run sort of over vast areas, maybe in the Midwest carrying grain, is different than the locomotive you need in a rail yard. And we should be able to have the flexibility to choose what we need to use in what circumstances to get the best benefit. Um, final, you know, another thing is performance based, not prescriptive regulations. Set a metric, set a target for industry to hit. We'll, we'll do it. We'll innovate. We'll maybe all use slightly different operating styles. We might use different uh, technologies to get there, but, but we can do it. What we can't have is a regulator say, well, you have to do it this way, be it uh, you know, from operating, have this many crew at this place, or do inspections only with people forever and ever and ever. It, it gets rid of all incentive and prevents sort of these new technologies from being installed and implemented. And again, finally, we need a federal framework that recognizes that while states do great things and the lo localities do great things, we need to be able to move across borders. And to do that, we just need one federal system, not a patchwork. So those are some of the big things that we are interested in, open to talking about. And uh, I will stop here and pass it along and be ready for questions. All right. Um, well, thank you. And uh, first of all, I should apologize if I have, have a bit of a cold, but uh, we're going to power through. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I think this is really exciting to have such a diversity of views, and especially being able to talk about um, not just trucks and not just railroads, but how all these things are sort of intertwined. And um, because really, transportation is an ecosystem. Um, 
And whenever we're introducing new technologies, we need to think of the introduction of these technologies not as um, sort of a, a, a massive disruption or sort of a, a roar, but instead a ripple, um, kind of ripple effects across the economy. Um, and especially in the case of autonomous trucks as we're seeing right now, um, there's a lot of excitement coming around about autonomous vehicles. Um, and there's also been a lot of fear uh, that's been generated by the thought of um, a lot of the truckers, uh, of truckers losing their jobs. Um, but when we step back and we take a look at the facts, the um, fact of the matter is that 50,000 trucking jobs are open at any given time. Um, and even if we replaced every single new truck on the road with an autonomous truck today, um, we would still have that shortage. Um, which is the reason that Walmart is trying to start paying more to drivers. I believe the most recent announcement was $85,000 a year for uh, new drivers coming on board. Um, and the, but the fact is that there is this fear of the new. Um, and this fear of the new is what um, often makes a lot of the entrenched actors afraid of new technologies. And um, as, as Joe was mentioning earlier, there's sort of this, um, there's, we should also be looking not just at, at at um, the technology we have today, but the opportunities we'll have tomorrow to, to compete in the global marketplace. Um, yesterday, President Trump signed an executive order uh, relating to artificial intelligence. Um, this was meant to make the U.S. more competitive on the, national, on the international stage um, by instructing the federal government to, and all federal agencies to work um, more in collaboration with, with one another and with innovators on development of AI technology. Um, and I think that things like this that we're seeing out of the administration should be seen as promising signs um, of an opportunity to work with regulators, um, to work with legislators um, on legislation such as the AV Start Act, which um, would have created a modern regulatory framework for AVs last year, but um, did fail to pass. Um, and one of the ongoing themes, I think, is, is this, is that um, prescriptive regulations um, are no longer suitable in a world where we're talking about art artificial intelligence and machine learning and when technology is moving so, so quickly. Um, and just as uh, FRA Administrator Batori had said, um, as soon as that ink dries, um, the technology is already gone. Um, and so this is why at, at SAFE, um, one of our priorities is working with the federal government, uh, working with the industry, uh, working with other stakeholders on determining what is the right path forward for um, not for autonomous uh, passenger vehicles, yes, but also autonomous trucks, and how do these things really fit together? And this is why we were encouraged by um, Automated Vehicles 3.0 uh, when uh, Secretary Chow released it um, last fall, and that um, the U.S. Department of Transportation's focus um, in this in the past couple years um, has been on creating these modern, flexible regulatory frameworks that focus on the performance um, of the technology rather than explicitly stating what uh, the technology should be doing. Um, there's this great saying as that we can use as an example, which is, um, you can always tell an engineer to do something, and they'll come back to you with a hundred reasons that they can't do it. But if you ask an engineer if they can do something, they'll come back with to you with 100 different ways they might think about going about doing that. And that's what we should be doing when we're talking about regulations. We should be opening up these discussions, opening up these ways um, and opportunities to innovate rather than trying to set out a course for the technology uh, ahead of time. Um, but I would also like to talk about the human element uh, in automation. Um, whenever we're talking about automation, it's easy to get lost in this idea of sort of the, the Terminator concept. Um, for anyone who saw Logan, the most recent uh, Wolverine movie, um, there were autonomous trucks that they had made to look scary. They were trying to run the, the main characters off the road, the protagonists. Um, and it's easy for those tropes to keep going and, and be exaggerated. Um, but instead, we need to be looking at what the human element is behind automation. What are we trying to achieve? Um, as mentioned before by Tom, um, 37,000 lives were lost in the roads last year um, due to human error um, or poor choice. Um, this is speeding. Um, this is distraction. This is driving under the influence. Um, if we can save those lives, if we can save the lives of our coworkers, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, um, that's an immense social gain. Um, and also, it's just the right thing to do. We have a moral responsibility to be um, taking on these technologies that can reduce collisions, that can um, also have numerous other social and economic benefits. Um, and just as a brief plug, um, SAFE re recently published a report, um, America's uh, Workforce and Self-Driving Future, um, which you can find at avworkforce.securityenergy.org. Um, 
well, I can also tweet it afterwards, but um, the point here is that there was a lot of confusion about what will happen with um, autonomous vehicles and trucking jobs, but moreover, we didn't have really a clear view um, a year and a half, two years ago, of how autonomous vehicles actually are going to impact the workforce and the, lo and the economy as a whole. So what we did was we got together with uh, three different groups um, of um, academics, including former uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics Commissioner Erica Groshen, um, and we asked them to go find out what the actual social economic benefits of autonomous vehicles are going to be, but also what the negative impacts will be. Um, what we found is that the reduction in collisions, um, the increases in efficiency that we're going to find from autonomous vehicles, will yield about $800 billion in annual benefits by 2050. Um, this is going to be done through con congestion mitigation, um, through um, improved quality of life by not being involved in a collision and being unable to work, um, and numerous other factors. Um, and one of the things that we also found was that the, um, a lot of the concerns about unemployment caused by autonomous trucking are overblown. Um, the fact of the matter is that truck drivers and bus drivers and other com drivers of commercial vehicles um, do a hell of a lot more than driving just driving the truck. They inspect the vehicle, they manage it, they make sure the freight is safe. And um, we really need to be viewing this as a whole, um, these operations as a whole, um, whenever we're assessing what the actual impacts are going to be. Um, through our work with um, former Commissioner um, Erica Groshen, we found that um, the increase in the unemployment rate will only be about 0.06% to 0.13%. Um, and that is far less than what happens, uh, what happened in the Great Recession um, and other similar recessions. Um, so again, you can find that at avworkforce.securityenergy.org. Um, um, and we also echo um, our interest in protecting the 5.9 gigahertz band uh, for connected vehicle applications. We believe this is critically important um, to enable platooning. And of course, we've seen that um, not everyone seems to agree on platooning anymore. Um, Daimler recently announced that they were no longer going to be pursuing it. Um, but this is part of experimenting with new technologies. And there's still a lot of companies that are working on this, such as Peloton, um, who see a potential for it, because there are a lot of different use cases. And um, Daimler in particular was testing um, largely in Europe, um, and which has very different operating um, uh, um, operational design domains um, than, um, than the US. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Okay, uh, I'd like to give the uh, panelists a chance to respond to uh, each other. Is there, I I for any of you, is there something that one of the others said you'd like to pick up on or comment on? No? No, no real. Okay, uh, good. Uh, I'd, I'd like to exert my prerogative to ask one question is we, we've had some talk about regulators, um, but I wonder if you could talk briefly about um, the the quality of the infrastructure, both as it e exists now, uh, our roads and bridges and ports, and, and also, I, you know, I w do we have enough now? Is it in good shape? And for the for the infrastructure we're building, are we building the right infrastructure, or should we be building smarter infrastructure to to sort of uh, take advantage of the, the way technology is, is, is likely to evolve over time. I'll start if I may. So the answer is no and yes, Joe. Okay, No and yes. What does that mean? That means there is consensus that, and this is obvious and it's been beaten like a dead horse, that we need to do something about surface transportation infrastructure in our country. We all know that. Uh, the U.S. Congress started the hearings last week. UPS testified last Thursday before the House Transportation Committee and the Senate Commerce Committee, where Adrian worked for years, is having a hearing tomorrow on the issue. And uh, of course, those of us who, regardless of kind of where you are in the infrastructure debate, we, we agree what needs to be done, uh, but there's challenges, political challenges and money challenges, which are well documented and I'm not going to regurgitate all the statistics <laughs> from what the American Society of Civil Engineer, Engineers says, because every time we go to one of these things, we start talking about the report card, but we all know the problem. So the answer is, is there enough sufficient infrastructure? And, and the answer is no. Uh, should it be smarter in the future? Yes, to your point. Uh, but we've struggled to maintain our current network in a state of good repair, right? Let alone enhance the network or build the network out. So we, we're struggling in that regard. And that, that's, that needs to be a focus of the future, absolutely. But it, it, the money issue is tough. And people don't want to spend, people meaning those people we elect, don't want to spend money on this. And 
It, and is it going to happen this year? Well, we've got a probably a six-month window, and that window is now probably down to four months, and that window is rapidly closing. And if it doesn't happen then, it probably won't happen until after the 2020 presidential election. And that's the sad state of where we are. <laughs> but it's not just important for UPS. It's important for Adrian trying to get to and from work, because I know the traffic she's in, trying to get to kid events. It's important. We have 400,000, 440,000 employees at UPS. Some of them, at the end of their day, want to go home and coach their son or daughter in sports or go to a church event or whatever. It, it, you know, we all suffer that. You know that. Everybody here knows that. So it's, we're pretty passionate about the issue, and we, UPS travels 2.9 billion miles in the United States, and we pay a lot of fuel taxes, and we've said, tax us more if it goes back into the network to make the network better and bigger and, you know, to enhance the network and improve fluidity and velocity. Um, you know, and we can't get people who like us or people who don't like us to raise our taxes on us. They, just, they won't do it. <laughs> it's kind of a joke, but, you know, we're going to keep banging our head against the wall till hopefully something changes. I, I'd echo that as well. I mean, the railroads are in a situation where we do, uh, you know, I, I mentioned we're privately owned. We, we invest in our own infrastructure. We spend $25 billion a year on it. But, but we also rely, you know, I also said one of our biggest customers is UPS. We need... We need good roads and infrastructure for our intermodal traffic. We also need good ports because a lot of our, our goods and services are starting or uh, are starting and ending in ports. So we also do support gas tax increase. We want the highway trust fund to be solvent. We we want the user pay system that sort of created the national highway system that we have to be maintained. And if that means we have to sort of change the way we're doing it, and we need to think about a, a vehicle miles travel t tax or so something else in the future, we we are interested and open to that. Uh, and we tomorrow. Uh, our president is going to be speaking at the Commerce Committee hearing that was just mentioned to sort of lay this out. But I think if you talk to anyone across transportation, they, they will give the same answer. Yes, we, we need more infrastructure, and yes, we need smart infrastructure. So I'm going to hop on those last two uh, points. Um, yes, absolutely. <coughs> um, we do need to uh, be focused on finding new revenue streams to, uh, for the Highway Trust Fund because uh, we're running out of time. The 2020 uh, REAS, the FAST Act, and thank you for your work on that, um, is, ne is due next year. Um, and on the note of smarter infrastructure, um, one of the things that keeps on coming up when we're talking to cities and states is um, how much should we be investing in, uh, say, V to I, uh, putting in DSRC sensors or uh, CV to X sensors, et cetera. Um, and there's no right answer for this um, because this is still largely um, up to uh, the local innovators, the local policy um, policymakers, to figure out um, what is the right sort of approach for them. Um, this DSRC versus um, cellular VDX thing is probably not going to be solved for another few years. Um, but instead, one thing that we should be focused on is maintaining what the roads that we already have. Anything that we do right now for AVs or to prepare for AVs um, should also be of benefit for human drivers too. Um, it should be mode neutral um, in terms of repairing potholes, <coughs> um, improving lane striping, um, having adequate signage. All those things we can do today to prepare for autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucks um, are things that will benefit human drivers today, and that should be the number one priority. Uh, does anyone from the audience have any questions? Yes. Yes, Chris Bladowski from Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. So on the one side, we have the technology, and on the other side, we have uh, regulation. Um, the technology is going to be shared. Maybe it is already shared internationally. I mean, I Europeans and the, and the Asians are working on autonomous technologies. And at some point, once it emerges, maybe it will be standardized, maybe it won't be standardized, but I think it will be replicated in some way. So that technology will be tied into regulation in the sense that similar technologies should be at some point regulated in similar ways. My question is, is there any attempt or um, process to talk to the other big stakeholders outside the United States, let's just say Europe, let's just pick Europe for, for the simplicity, in terms of regulation, how they approach uh, regulating automation going in the future? Is, are we on the same page or are we on different pages? You know, Chris, I, that's a great point. I think the premise is, is sound, and I think the answer is no. I think it's uh, been done kind of in a standalone fashion. So for many large uh, multinational companies, we're, we're super interested, and we're, we've got, you know, colleagues and folks over there that are engaged on the, on the, the same debate 
in different parts of the world, but there's not been a good opportunity to compare and contrast, you know, best but we're, we're behind them, there's no question. And we're not in a situation where we're in a uh, synchronized, you know, uniform, harmonized. We've seen harmonization in a lot of other aspects of our business internationally, but for, as it relates to this, we've not seen harmonization yet. Uh, and, you know, maybe we need to get there, but we've got our own challenges here, frankly, thus far. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, in the U.S., we have a fairly uh, permissive um, structure in terms of our um, auto regulations through NHTSA um, and that uh, you don't have to go through this pre-market approval <coughs> before you can take a vehicle to market. Um, instead, you uh, self-certify that you're complying with Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, um, which are largely uh, very prescriptive. Um, but you are, you know, as an automaker, you're um, ensuring that you're doing it yourself. And then the, what happens is NHTSA will go out and buy cars from random dealerships in order to test uh, for defects and um, also to ensure that um, they're in compliance. But you don't have to go through this um, sort of longer process um, that happens in Europe. Um, in Europe, instead, there's a, a type certification process um, through which you have to get your vehicle, you have to go through pre market approval before you can take a vehicle to market. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is that the so Society of Automotive Engineers um, has a, um, a committee right now or some sort of delegation where um, folks from the EUS and EU are talking about potential ways to harmonize these regulations. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that um, we're operating in two very different regulatory environments. And Europe has had for a long time the ability to have adaptive headlights um, on new vehicles, um, which actually been shown to significantly reduce the potential for collisions by making sure that, um, that a headlight does not blind someone. Um, and meanwhile, in the US, we have this very strict um, FMVSS around headlights um, that, pre that prevents these brand new, you know, um, sort of newfangled lights uh, from being put on our vehicles. Um, so there are, there are benefits and drawbacks to both. Um, I think Europe has been faster to um, adopt and to uh, some new technologies, but also the U.S. has been where a lot of um, new technologies around safety have been um, first deployed. Um, things like AEB um, for collision warning, things like that. Um, we're often um, first to take them up, not by forcing automakers um, to uh, implement them, but actually by giving automakers the freedom to add these new technologies to their vehicles from time to time, unless we're by FMVSS. So it's, it gets a little convoluted, um, but overall I think that we have a long way to go if we actually want to reconcile these two very different systems. I mean, I don't think I have that much to add. One thing I'd say is, one, going forward, I think it would be helpful, too, for regulators to sort of do these discussions you're talking about and learn from each other. For instance, you know, in Australia, they already have a fully autonomous train running to and from uh, a mine out to the, the port, and it functions you know, perfectly well and safe. And so I, I think, you know, for our regulators at home, looking at sort of models across, across the world and how they're working and sort of other places are leaning in should be something that you know, helps them make decisions, but also probably, hopefully, encourages them to move a little faster. Yes, uh, good morning, panelists. John Bird with the National Society of Professional Surveyors. Her members are using unmanned aerial systems to do survey and mapping and geospatial data collections. Quick comment and a follow-up question, I guess. Um, Greg, you mentioned the AI executive order. Uh, Adrian mentioned the sensor technology for track maintenance. And Tom, you mentioned LIDAR. Um, technology. Uh, the nationwide LIDAR program is in USGS. It's known as the 3D elevation program, known as 3DEP. And uh, the, the connection for freight, I think, potentially would be this. The, the smart cities employment of 5G, AI's connection to 5G, and then the rural um, broadband deployment for farming and rural communities for 5G. How do you all see blending geospatial technology, surveying data, to help kind of get at the aims for smarter use of freight systems? I can tell you this: we got a lot of smart people at UPS trying to figure that out, and I'm not one of them. So. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, honestly, we 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 um, tell you what we've done. We have a group that of cross-functional engineer and tech and IT types that have that we didn't have six years ago. How about that? That's saying we figured out really good on how to do the basic core competency of delivering a package from a little brown truck and, and larger freight movements, but how do we 
look at those, integrate those kind of technologies, and we're, we're wrestling with it, frankly. We really are. And, and I, understand we, I understand the question, but we've got a lot of different opinions from a lot of smart folks and uh, key points within the organization trying to, to figure out what that looks like in the future. We, we really are. And I think our competitors are wrestling with it too, and so UPS, for, not to share anything that's proprietary, of course, uh, we're trying to build a better mousetrap for ourselves, and we're also trying to keep up with the other guys. So, but that's, that's a great point. And we understand what your folks do and how they do it, and, and we see broad applications and efficiencies, productivity, you know, which nothing wrong with that, safety, right, and sustainability in adopting these technologies. So I, I, I get the question, but I can't tell you really where we are, frankly. I can give you an example I know of an application. Um, a few years back, Congress mandated the, uh, that trains be equipped with positive train control. There was a lot of sort of discussion about it. And I, I remember when they were sort of figuring out how you're going to deploy it across the country, one of the things they had to figure out is where you need to put your wayside towers. And so they used this geospatial data to be able to figure, you know, different topographies, you know, how tall the tower has to be, how far the line of sight is, sort of, uh, you know, some places it's, you know, you have to have it very close, some places you can have it very far. And so I remember sitting in some rooms with folks when they were looking at it from a sort of a, how the towers would impact from a historical preservation or a tribal rights perspective, these big geospatial maps and they're pointing out where they're gonna be. So, I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure there are much more, many more examples, but that's one that I, I know of specifically. I, uh, I know that it was key to sort of working out a lot of those problems. Yeah, and one of the um, things about um, the 5G build out um, combined with um, 3D mapping and LIDAR is the fact is that we need to be able to have the digital infrastructure to transmit a lot of this data. Um, and that's where the 5G pl uh, play in is, but also the, from an AI perspective, uh, machine learning perspective, being able to actually process in this information after we gather it. Um, you know, an autonomous vehicle is estimated to um, take in about uh, up to maybe a one terabyte of data uh, per day. Um, that's an immense amount of data that we'll be collecting through our LiDAR systems. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to tr transmit that and if we actually have the, the speeds to do so. Um, and the other important element here too is if we're, if we're um, undertaking a, a giant mapping project, a project that for all of our cities and all of our roadways, um, that's going to be immensely important to realize the actual safety benefits for autonomous vehicles. Um, and to allow these vehicles to achieve their full potential. So um, there are a lot of different things that are interacting here. And um, as we discussed, this is a revolution. Uh, this is an evolution, not a revolution. Um, and this evolution relies upon a lot of these different parts sort of growing together and evolving together. Now, the other thing I'd add, and I think this is interesting and relevant, uh, uh, cities are gotten, have become much, much more focused on these kind of issues, as you can imagine, for, for congestion relief purposes, uh, to work with consumers and the new emerging, all the, the way the commerce has changed and all the residential deliveries. And the, my point is this, UPS has been asked more than ever before uh, by all kinds of municipalities and, and cities, big and small, tell us about your routing. Tell us when you're here. The whole urban congestion management, smart cities thing, uh, urban logistics, we're getting deep on that and we've got a lot of folks that want our data and they want data, we like to think, for the right reasons, but you know, large companies can be a little bit protective about that, for understandably so. Uh, we are partnering with a number of cities on uh, working on, again, trying to build that better mousetrap as it relates to curb space, congestion management, and what cities of the future. So this is a huge emerging area, I think, as many of you know, in, in urban areas. And we're pretty deep on that now. You know, we've gotten tired of getting millions of dollars of parking tickets every year and trying to <laughs> trying to figure out a better way by working with the cities, right? Because they, you know, that brown truck is an easy mark in many cases. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Don Litzkoff with Wabtech. Um, would you all give us your perspective on the importance of cyber integrity as we move forward in automation and also address um, your thoughts on the uh, growing role or potential growing role of foreign state-owned enterprises in the U.S. Uh, network as we proceed through automation? Well, Don, we, the, the, I'll take in reverse order, the foreign-owned state enterprises issue, uh, we're, we're, I'm not going to comment on it, frankly. We've been involved in UPS is interested in that. We're familiar with the issue, and there's been a variety of context as it relates to ports and things of that nature, other transportation enterprises. We're not really interested in uh, saying anything about that publicly. But however, um, 
data is a huge concern, as you know. Uh, we have huge, vast amounts of data because we've got millions and millions of customers that we interface with every day. And organizations are protective of that data for a variety of reasons, as we discussed. And you know, we've got, or we've got cyber concerns about our own data uh, and our own customer information. And we've got cyber concerns about uh, sharing it and about interfacing with other organizations as, um, as these things evolve. So that's, a, that's an impediment to, to these smarter systems moving forward. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and I, I mean, I was just speaking of positive train control. I mean, that technology is designed to prevent overspeeding, head on head, head on collisions, and sort of uh, similar accidents. So, and that all involves a sort of you know a background that is working with servers and all the technology, which I don't fully understand. I will admit, but all of that is vulnerable. I know to cybersecurity. So we've spent an immense amount of time and effort, sort of focused on that because. I mean, in the worst case scenario, I mean, you can imagine what could happen if, you know, someone hacked in and how dangerous it would be. So it is, it is something that we take very seriously and we spend a lot of time and effort on. And then, you know, then there's the data side. I was explaining earlier that we really are a big data collecting company for all sort of all sorts of metrics to make sure we run better and safer. And so protecting that is clearly important. Um, as far as the foreign owned, you know, we, we've been sorry to talk to some of our sort of member companies about it. The Transportation Infrastructure Committee is very interested in it. I know Chairman DeFazio is talking about doing something. I think we haven't been faced with it directly. Um, again, we are, we are privately owned and we buy all of, you know, buy our stuff here in America. So we haven't had as uh, big of a problem, but I know the commuter rails are starting to struggle with it. And on the note of cybersecurity, um, one of the biggest concerns that um, consumers report having um, in surveys about AVs um, is often cybersecurity. Um, and the problem with cybersecurity is that it's not something where you can just build a wall um, and then you're safe from uh, invaders, right? Um, and also, the fact of the matter is, too, that um, we can't set prescriptive standards around cybersecurity, and that scares a lot of people. Um, it, for anyone who followed the uh, the AV bills that were going through Congress um, in, the, in the past two years, um, Senator uh, Blumenthal um, raised a lot of concerns about the lack of prescriptive cybersecurity standards um, in AV start, and he insisted on um, it, on inserting language that would um, try and um, force the creation of cybersecurity standards. But the fact of the matter is, we're dealing with asymmetric warfare um, now when we're talking about cybersecurity. Um, we're not talking about a world where you can build a, a castle like we did in the medieval ages to keep the barbarians out. Um, what we're talking about when we're talking about prescriptive cybersecurity regulations is probably just building this castle, having some secret, I secret uh, tunnels in and out, and then passing the blueprints to the barbarians and staying in the castle and letting them in. Um, instead, we need to be looking at what are the right ways to be focusing on cybersecurity. And one of the best ways that we've already found, um, th and that 99% of um, automakers um, in the U.S. are uh, participating in, is Auto ISAC, um, it's an Automotive Information Sharing and Analysis Center, um, where they allow for um, removing the proprietary information from cybersecurity um, incidents and threats and helping the entire, um, the entire auto industry to share information about um, these threats and prevent them from happening in the first place, but also to make sure the industry doesn't make the same mistake twice um, on cybersecurity, um, which I think is one of the most important things we could possibly be doing is looking at how we can be cooperating on that. Any other questions? No, no, maybe, maybe, Tom, can you talk about some of the stuff that you're doing with drones or thinking about doing? Well, I have to start with an apology because Rachel was so nice and easy to work with. I sent her an awesome picture of a drone coming out of a UPS truck and it didn't get in on the screen, unfortunately. So, yeah, my fault. So, I, that's a bummer because we've uh, one application, which in the future would be really neat stuff, and not just UPS, but some competitors are thinking about is, again, are there ways to utilize drones for uh, rural and super rural? Uh, small package delivery, and you've seen this or heard this, and you could kind of look up on your phone the, the UPS example, which is a little brown truck, what we call a package car. We got 65,000 of these in the United States, and um, uh, without, unfortunately, the best I can do is hold up a photo of it, and on the top of it, there is a cradle, and there's a drone coming out of it, and that's a real uh, prototype vehicle 
where in a, again, rural or super rural area, let me be clear about that, not within the Beltway in Washington or in Midtown Manhattan, where this little brown truck might have to go down a driveway that's two miles long to make a package delivery. Well, why doesn't the little brown truck go stop? The drone goes out the back top of the vehicle, goes to five miles in one direction, delivers a small three pound lightweight package. The little brown truck goes down a two mile driveway. The little brown truck starts to come back up and they link up again and the drone comes back in through the top of the vehicle. So how cool is that? And that's one potential application. Again, not in practice. Let me, that's the caveat. And, I, and this is the photo I wanted to share with you guys. So what would happen was, uh, in that fashion, the driver is that much, he or she is that much more productive in this rural or super rural area because they're largely different, delivering residential packages with a lot of what we call windshield time or drive time. And the drone is help assisting by going, taking this parcel to a small, to a, again, to a, a re make a residential delivery while the truck is doing another one. So that's the thought, Joe. We we had a press event in, gosh, first quarter of 17 now, believe it or not, on a blueberry farm. I didn't know there was blueberry farms in Florida. Um, and I, yeah, who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Uh, in Western, in, on the west coast of Florida, where we showed this to a bunch of press folks, and people were all fired up and it made the news, and the thought was, this is what it might look like in the future. So just one area we're looking at, like I said, one of our competitors has, has talked about package freighters. These are large, large aircraft. Uh, flying autonomously. Now there's no crew in there and there's of course labor issues related to that um, but the the super rural thing is cool. Amazon of course has done quite a bit of experimentation in this area, a lot in Europe on this on the same project and we're trying to once again figure out a better ways to s and, and more sustainable and more efficient ways to serve our customers and we're also looking at what other folks might be doing as well. So that's that's kind of neat stuff. We're not there yet but we need an FAA regulatory scheme that would allow for the commercial application of drones other than this application process for these one-off things that's going on now. Audience? Not, um, go ahead. Two questions. My name is Mike. Oops. Hi, my name is Mike Ducker from J.E. Austin. The first question is, I was just wondering, if you, several of you mentioned some of the local governments are pretty much more aggressive on s opening up the regulations and experimenting, and maybe you had some examples of some cities and states that are doing it, maybe even for strategic reasons, like you know the Michigan area. Um, the second question is, to the, to the principles that you started off, Joe, I was wondering if there's some conflicts with sort of uh, uh, an older embedded industry like the automotive industry in Detroit that probably wants is evolution versus uh, Silicon Valley type, you know, AV who wants us to go to disruption and how that might work within the regulations of making sure that they both are, have the same opportunity without, you know, protecting one versus the other. Well, just, you know, from a UPS perspective, uh, the, related to what states or municipalities that are maybe more uh, progressive here, more open-minded, I mean, we have states, we're working on this platooning concept that we've talked about and Greg talked about, I discussed earlier. We, we're doing a pilot right now in Texas on that. So this, these are big, open uh, highway areas where it's flat, where there's less people, where you can probably pilot and test that. We're working on uh, platooning in Texas right now. Uh, Nevada has been very aggressive in that. We were, were in 10 states or more or so have actually uh, passed legislation to, law, to allow the deployment, uh, first the pilots and the deployment of uh, platooning legislation. So there's states that are doing it, but other areas of the country where the states uh, aren't are really, really concerned and nervous about that, and hence we're getting we're getting that patchwork. Many of the cities, as I indicated earlier, you know, we're doing some neat stuff with Columbus, Ohio. They won that competition, DOT competition on smart cities. So that's a good example of them coming to us and saying, hey, let's work together on urban delivery and urban access for curbs and traffic flows and trying to, to, to help us and help you. You know, you know, time is money. So if our people are locked up in traffic and getting ticketed every two minutes and can't move vehicles, that's not a good deal for us either. So uh, Columbus is a good example of a city that's done that. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, conversations and some experimentation and pilots with, with New York City. And it's been a little challenging and it's, of course it's kind of mega city versus Columbus or versus a play in, out in Wyoming. We've done some things in Wyoming. Uh, there's DOT money that the state applied for and the state got the money to work on kind of some smart technology and tractor trailers communicating with fixed objects. So we're, so we're getting there. Many of the things we discussed on the vehicle, the vehicle and vehicle infrastructure, that's, that's in Wyoming which is, you know, we're not talking big cities here. Can we, can we refine some of that? So it's been interesting to us. 
Uh, we've got more people than ever before coming to us and saying, hey, UPS, we've got an idea for you. And when I say people, it might be a city. It might be the person who runs the DOT in that city or someone who's involved in their innovation council in, in states than we've ever had before. And I think that's, that's the same thing for our competitors on the trucking side. They're getting solicited by a lot of folks as well. Well, I think um, I answer that question too. One of the things that we're seeing is a lot of states considering uh, mandating operating mostly on the crew size. So I know Maryland's been considering it. Uh, Wyoming has a law out. Uh, but there's about a half dozen states that the legislature this year is ca considering mandating two-man crews in locomotives in perpetuity forever and ever and ever. And I mean, that clearly stifles innovation and our ability to bring on new technologies and new innovation and new automation um, if forever and ever we're sort of locked into the current way that we're doing things right now. Yeah, um, on, the to on the note of autonomous vehicles, um, Tom had said earlier that we want to have a network um, rather than a patchwork. Um, and one of the things we've seen uh, with states passing their own autonomous vehicle laws is that um, they're all sort of creating different uh, rules of the road for, um, AV, uh, for AV manufacturers and testers to be uh, working with them. Um, but rather than focus on, you know, just sort of the, the litany of bills we've seen in the past few years, I'd like to zoom in on a couple of states that were uh, great. Um, number one is uh, my home state of California, um, obviously sort of led the way on creating those, uh, while well, passing the second um, set of autonomous vehicle bills um, that has shown us a lot, allowed us to see a lot of the information about testing and how many miles are being driven, et cetera. Um, and while those aren't perfect metrics, um, they at least set the stage for seeing what that looks like. Um, but one city uh, that, was, that I've been very impressed with um, in terms of testing um, has been uh, Miami. Um, and the state of Florida has also been a tremendous partner, um, it seems, to, um, to Ford and Argo um, in their deployment of autonomous vehicles down there. Um, I had the chance to go down there um, in November. And um, the, the city of Miami actually was working with um, Ford and Argo on having uh, flexible curb spaces, so pick up drop off points um, for picking up and dropping off uh, passengers that they can also look at using for freight as well. Um, but what it really gets down to is that we need to figure out, and the federal government needs to take a leading role in setting long term um, regulatory frameworks for these technologies. Otherwise, um, we're going to have to deal with this series of uh, this patchwork of regulations around the technology. Any other questions? I guess uh, I'll ask, does the federal, you know, you, you just mentioned what the federal reg regulators need to do. do. Do you think they have the resources to do that right now, both in, in uh, obviously money, but also, you know, the, the knowledge of their key people? Are, the, you know, are they able to, to not only get, but also keep some of the best people and to keep them continually trained on what, what is coming down the pike over the next five, ten years, and to have the time to think deeply about what the regulatory response should be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the folks that I've met at NHTSA and at DOT more broadly have been um, just incredibly impressive in terms of expertise and passion about the technology and also um, for setting out a vision for how automation can benefit humans rather than being um, employed for technology itself. Um, but. I will say this, um, when we shut down the Department of Transportation for three or four months, uh, for three or four weeks rather, um, we're slowing down defect investigations and recalls. Um, we're slowing down reviews. Um, some automakers were experiencing delays um, on rolling out some new models because no one was home at NHTSA because we had a government shutdown. Um, and also, yes, I mean, I, I believe that we should be funding, putting more funding towards NHTSA um, and towards research programs um, at DOT. Um, because if we don't, we run the risk of losing a lot of those experts to uh, the private sector. Um, and for anyone who's been following or in touch with a lot of those folks, uh, DOT and NHTSA lost quite a few people um, in the past couple of months um, who were experts in this field um, and who were really helping to drive um, these automation policies. I mean, I generally think, you know, employees at DOT are more than capable of doing this. You know, I think always a problem in any bureaucracy is you're siloed and sort of how much you're allowed when we talk about things being mode neutral technology neutral being able to work across the modes because DOT is a very siloed sort of department and it, and right just keeping and maintaining sort of the people there from the, the long term is always a challenge okay 
we, I think we have time for one last question. Anybody wants to see out? I'll otherwise, have, I've got one more. So uh, w w just briefly, what, what do you think, what would be your one message to both uh, regulators and, I guess, Congress about what they can do or concentrate on over the next five years? I'd, I'd say just work with industry, Joe. I think we've got folks who are, well, for a variety of reasons, philosophical, political, old habits, old habits die hard kind of perspectives that, you know, I think they need to be willing to work with industry. The, um, you, re you referenced earlier one of the questions about what do the innovators think, and we're working very closely mm -hmm. with the innovators because the innovators, that's us. <laughs> We've got people coming to us all the time that are either trying to, uh, big organizations and like Adrian's members and my organization that are trying to take our business, trying to recreate what we do, trying to cherry pick, trying to do it better, calling up and saying, hey, we can help you with this, with that. I mean, we have, uh, UPS has a small venture capital fund where we make investments in these technologies and these companies to try to figure it out, which is kind of cool, right? And, and uh, we've got, uh, I would suggest that these, these super ideas are coming from the private sector and we want government to be open-minded about them. And I, and I think most policymakers would say that if they were sitting on the panel with us, but maybe sometimes that's difficult in the context of the way our institution, government institutions work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think having them work with us and sort of having them be open to a little bit of, you know, risk. It's not a thing that politicians like to do. I, uh, they're, they're not very risk tolerant, but I think, you know, all the things that make technology interesting and exciting also can make it technology scary and, um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. And so I think, you know, working together to sort of overcome that and uh, really, Put, to, put out stuff that allows us to, to again, have performance-based measures, sort of prescriptive, is, is the key. Yeah, and I, I want to pull on, the, um, on, that, on that note of um, being risk-averse. Um, for a long time, we've, we've thought of safety and the, the, the paradigm of safety as being based upon um, trying to reduce risks or, or um, be averse to risks. Um, for a long time, safety advocacy and being a safety advocate meant um, reducing harm um, after a crash happens. Um, instead, we should be looking at this holistically and saying, how do we prevent crashes from happening in the first place? Um, and how can regulators be working um, with, with innovators um, to try and prevent crashes from happening in the first place, to try and predict, prevent bottlenecks from happening in the first place? Uh, we need to be moving towards a paradigm of risk mitigation, um, not just risk aversion. Um, and I think it's been heartening to see that there's so much interest in all these new um, technologies. Um, and it's not just in transportation. I mean, this is happening in energy. This is happening um, even in the Department of Interior. They're looking at new ways of uh, working on, um, using, uh, on, on using our natural resources, on uh, extracting critical minerals, things like this. Um, and so we need to be working together and having a conversation, public, private, um, bringing everyone around the table. Okay, well, I'd just add one final word. So the Economist uh, 1843 magazine recently had a short story on the pushback that uh, that building operators were getting of uh, people who, di who were reluctant to use elevators that didn't have a human operator uh, as the industry was trying to shift over. And part of the reason was because the technology, it was a little tricky to get the elevator to stop at right just that level with the floor and you had to open the manual, uh, the doors manually, but eventually, um, you know, now you can't find a human elevator anywhere, I don't think. And so this isn't an, uh, a new problem, it's an old problem, and eventually we get the technology right. So hopefully we can smooth that process. Uh, I, ho I hope you'll, uh, I'm going to ask you to th uh, join me in thanking our panel for their thanks and thank you for coming out.